wanted to speak about studying aviation and aerospace in the United States. Um, when we go to the student fairs or high schools, this is a large uh, request. We get a lot of students asking about aeronautics in the United States and, and how to study in this field. So we're going to spend some time looking at uh, how to think about we're going to, to take time looking at what is aeronautics, uh, what are some of the programs of study that fall within that category, and then try to help you with helping your students understand what types of courses they need to get to prepare for admission into a program like this. So kind of wide ranging topic that we'll, that we'll talk about. Um, We'll introduce ourselves. My name is Andy Freyer, and I am the director of the Center for International Programs and Services at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona. You'll see more about that in just a, a little bit. Um, and my co-presenter. Hi, my name is. It's on. Hi, my name is Kelsey Jensen. I am the senior international admissions counselor at Iowa State University. Okay. So at, when we're standing at a college fair or in your high schools and we're at our table and students come up, the question we get is, I want to study aeronautics. We get that a lot. And every time Kelsey and I hear that, the first thing we do is, you need to tell me a little bit more than that. Aeronautics is a very broad definition. So here are uh, three choices for you, and we want to ask you what you think the actual definition of aeronautics is. C, you say? OK. Any other choices, C or B or A? What do you think is the most correct? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. So the actual answer is A, a science that deals with airplanes and flying. This is from Merriam-Webster. You can probably find other definitions out there, but in general, aeronautics is a science that deals with airplanes and flying. So as you can see, this is very broad. I mean, you can read a lot into this. What does that include, airplanes and flying? So here's the actual definitions I pulled. Two areas that come to mind when you talk about aeronautics are aviation, which is the actual practice of flying aircraft, okay? So even within that, there's different layers of, of responsibilities within aviation. You could have a pilot, you can have a navigator, you can have air traffic management, so on the ground, people managing the, the traffic of airplanes going through. You can have maintenance. Uh, there's a whole range of things within aviation, even. Aerospace is basically anything that flies, whether it's within the Earth's gravitational pull or outside of the Earth's gravitational pull. So when we discuss aeronautics, you can get into all of these different aspects of it that include astronautics and space travel, as well as design of satellites, uh, rocketry systems, propulsion, thermodynamics, aerodynamics. There are, there are a broad range of factors. So I guess the first thing I would ask when you're working with your students and you hear, I want to study aeronautics, let's start to winnow that definition down for them and really determine what it is that they want to study within this field because there are many ways that you can go. Aeronautics is too broad. Do you want to add anything to that, Kelsey? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, so here are some fields involved in aviation, aeronautics, and aerospace. We'll just let you take a look at all of those. So as you can see, there are multiple layers, and, and that's just what came to the top of my mind. Within this field, you have business implications, you have security implications, intelligence gathering, um, you've got the technical side of it, certainly, the, the aerospace design, aeronautical design, um, materials, structures, 
you have aviation, you have air traffic management, you have meteorology involved in it, astronomy. Maybe we, can we pause that scroll anywhere in there and <laughs> let that, so that we can see what's in there. Oops. All right, so on, on this screen, you can see the different categories that fall within or some of the different categories that fall within the field of aeronautics or within the broad definition of aeronautics. Um, and as you can tell, even an engineer, if a student tells you they want to be an aeronautical engineer, there are very specific aspects of aeronautical engineering that I think a student needs to understand. That could be aerodynamics, structures, uh, propulsion, it could also involve electrical engineering, it can involve computer engineering, software engineering. We've even started a program on our campus now in simulation, uh, game design, and animation. So that will work in simulators that, that students may design and build for aviation and aerospace. Um, there is the flight aspect. There's a business aspect to aviation. As a global industry, you are moving goods and materials, people, tourism through the business side and there is a specific aviation business program that could really apply for students that allows them to do multiple things within the industry. Um, as I mentioned, meteorology is not in on this list but the study of weather is another big aspect. So again, I think the point that I want to make is that aeronautics is a very broad term and we should find our students best fit for a program as you assess their skills and their abilities, what's going to be the best thing that, that will fit for them? Any questions? Does this? Excellent, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Right, right. Yeah, good point. And, uh, you know, I didn't even add that onto here, but unmanned aerial systems mm -hmm. is an aspect of aviation and aeronautics that students are becoming more interested in. Um, and I think even within that, you need to decide between what type of unmanned aerial systems is the student interested in. At my campus, do you do UAS as well? So maybe ours are different focus. My campus focuses on the smaller drones. And we design those for uh, emergency management situations, commercial aspects. So there are fewer regulations and international students are allowed to study that at my campus. I don't know for you guys. So at Iowa State University, ours is actually used for agriculture. We actually have a rule in the city of Ames where you cannot fly, you can't go lower than one, 200 meters with a drone. 200 you're, meters. You're not allowed to go to, three, I'm sorry, 300 meters with a drone. I'm doing conversions in my head right now. I do apologize. Okay. You're not allowed to fly a unmanned or uncommercial area in the city of Ames at 300 meters or below. But the farmers get away from it because they use drones for agricultural research and crop search. They also use it for soil integrate. And in the Midwest, um, we have to have sustainability, and they also use that for agricultural purposes. So in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, we do have drone production specifically for that. We also have, our in our aerospace engineering program, we do have drone workshops. And we've actually had NASA come onto our campus and teach us about the drones that using for out of space in different federal regulations. And there's another aspect, at least one other that you can take, and that's the military grade uh, unmanned aerial systems. And in the United States, at least, those are typically restricted areas to U.S. citizens, but there may be some ways that you could work through that. I know our Daytona Beach campus in Florida works on the military aspects of, of drone research and engineering. And so um, as students are looking at those things, again, look at their interests, look at their skills and abilities and determine the best path for them to go if they're interested in studying this in the United States. Keeping in mind that there may be federal regulations that 
limit their ability to be in certain programs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know how schools are in the U.S. Some schools have very good websites and very good information. Some don't. I think the best thing is to speak with the, the department themselves and see what those regulations might be. The catalog of the university may say something about this degree program is restricted to U.S. citizens only. Um, so dependent on, on those things, and, and there's a regulation in the United States called ITAR. It's the International Trafficking in Arms regulation and so that is going to be the factor that will determine whether or not a non-citizen of the US can be involved in some of this research and development so ITAR I-T-A-R yes That, that's a great question, and this is something I actually learned about a couple of weeks ago when I had a when we had students coming for a high school pathways program for international students, and the College of Agriculture actually set up a drone system for us and showed us how they use the drone for their agriculture. So what the drone is doing is looking at crop production and crop soil. They're also looking at the growth of the plants, how fast are they growing, and also they're also detecting for plant, um, excuse me, plant seeding. Um, they also help with uh, soil. It's mostly used for soil circulation and making sure the runoffs. So in the state of Iowa, we actually have runoffs. So where the water is going is into these kind of creek beds area and that plots out the land. So we wanna make sure the plots and acreage and also the detection of plant diseases or any kind of soil disconfiguration. So it's also measuring the runoff of the water into the plants. And as you can probably imagine from that, there are multiple applications that you can take in geography, in um, land use analysis, in business uh, needs for business development and things like that. Plus we take it to the disaster response and threat assessment area in the security and intelligence field as well. Um, I don't know if, if you know, but in Prescott, Arizona, where I live and where my university is located, we had a disastrous wildfire that went through there about three years ago. And 19 of our firefighters from our city were killed in that, in that wildfire. If they had had the drone capability to fly in above and find them, they may have been able to save them. So these are things that are really practical applications of this technology that students there's great opportunity, but as Kelsey mentioned, there are regulations too. The Federal Aviation Administration is limiting. They've published new regulations like is coming out in India now on who can fly them, where you can fly them, what types of airspace you can be in. There's, it's very complicated. Um, but that's all part of aeronautics. Um, so again, let's, let's try to determine for these students and maybe identify specifically within this field what it is so that they can ask good questions of us when they come to see us. Can I just one more question? Sure. Let's say they wanted to go into engineering. Yeah. Let's say they go into an engineering program. Sure. And they want to eventually branch out into aeronautics. Yep. Is there programs in your university that let them do an overall general mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a, a really great question. question, and then we'll actually discuss this later in yeah. our presentation. Yeah, so, okay. Any other questions on these fields that we have listed here? And again, this is not an exhaustive list. This was me saying, oh, here's what I can think of <laughs> within this field. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, so, yep. Those are the tips we'll Yeah. We'll take a look at what are some preparation things that students will need. We'll actually list some of these for you and we'll talk it more in detail about that. Yeah. Um, but I think all of these are really good, good topics of discussion. Um, because we, we want to make it easier for you to be able to, to speak to them about the opportunities that we have available to us.
So when a, when a potential student indicates interest in aeronautics, what does that mean? What would we like to see from that student? Um, first step is what aspect of aeronautics are you interested in? We just had a great discussion on unmanned aerial systems. That's one part of it. So do you want to be involved in the design of aircraft or spacecraft or unmanned aerial systems? You want to fly an aircraft or a spacecraft. Um, do you want to manage the traffic at airports or over your national airspace? Do you want to manage an airline or an airport or the companies that are associated with the aviation industry, hospitality and tourism? So that's another aspect of aeronautics. Or do you want to make your aviation systems and your, your facilities within your countries more safe and reliable for passengers and for military use and all of those things? What other areas might students be interested in within this field can you think of? Or things that you may have heard from them? I'm sorry? Hospitality. So yeah, I, I think that's within a program like Aviation Business Administration, they can look at the hospitality industry as, again, as a global uh, business, aviation is able to impact the hospitality and tourism industry on a major scale. Uh, without it, we don't have hospitality and tourism like we do today, right? So the Aviation Business Administration will focus on those types of issues within the aeronautics field. So it's a very specific degree. It's a business degree that focuses on the aviation industry. I would also just like to point out in the United States right now, um, our three major carriers in the United States are Delta, American, and United. And the biggest overhaul in customer service has actually happened in the last three years. Yeah. And it's schools like Emory Riddle that have taken note to this. And they have definitely right. set up their business to look focused on a customer service aspect because at the end of the day, Americans are so sick of the American airline industry yeah. and we have to fly it on a regular basis. Yeah. So <laughs> it is now becoming essential for these consultants and corporations to look at um, all of it from rewards programs to customer service to their ratings because now Americans are going, I'm not just gonna buy the cheapest ticket. I also want the customer service to go with it because right. our economy is developing so much right now and so rapidly that we're saying, I can afford to not buy the cheapest ticket. I can afford that extra $25 to get a good customer service experience in an on-time matter. And that is something that's been a huge overhaul in the United States, and it's now bringing back to India. I've seen Air Indigo step up exponentially. I've seen SpiceJet, who is a cheaper carrier here in India, step up its customer service because they're trying to retain these customers. And it's stuff like that in AVA Ambition excuse me, aviation, <laughs> that we are starting to focus on at our, at, especially at Emory Riddle. I can, I can justify that one. <laughs> so, again, there, uh, there are so many aspects to this, to the, the whole field of aeronautics that go beyond just design of aircraft or spacecraft or um, understanding the, the structures and materials. There's, there's a lot that goes into this global industry, um, and I think we can help students to understand that. And the advantage, I'd say, what's the next slide? Or, okay, so after you've kind of determined what it is that students are interested in, then let's assess and direct them to the proper path. Um, what's their future career goal? If they want to be a pilot, you can study in the United States and get a degree and get your flight ratings and have everything to be a pilot. But what happens if you have an injury or an illness that doesn't allow you to fly any longer? Um, so there are other aspects, and this is where an aviation business administration degree can help because you could do those and get your flight ratings at the same time. Um, so maybe the degree in flight isn't necessarily the one that's best suited for that student. Uh, they may want to have another option later on down the line or something that directs them to an MBA later 
or to an engineering degree at a later point in time. So you may want to work with students if they're interested in just being a pilot and say, being a pilot is great, but you want to have some other backup plan because you never know what's going to happen physically that may limit you from flying someday. Um, and so always have that, with aviation in particular, have that backup plan in place. If they're interested in becoming an engineer, we want to then speak about math, physics, and science. Those are the skills definitely mandatory for any student coming into a technical degree program. So we are looking at, for students interested in engineering, they need to prepare in math, 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 math and physics, <laughs> plus chemistry. Um, and this is across the board in engineering programs in the US. And what I would also like to say is students may access aeronautical things through other degree paths. It doesn't necessarily have to be aerospace engineering or, or aeronautical engineering. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> As I said, they may be able to do computer or electrical engineering and work in designing systems for aviation and aerospace that develop the, the software and the hardware for the computers that fly our planes. We all think that pilots are flying our planes. No. Pilots take off and land. When the plane is in flight, it actually is, is not optimal for it to be left to a human to control that plane. For fuel economy, for um, efficiency of the engines, and just making sure you maintain a stable attitude, that plane is flying on computers when you're cruising. Until there might be turbulence and they have to change altitude or something. But they punch it into a computer in the cockpit and it, <laughs> it flies at a higher altitude or whatever. So there are huge applications in computer software and electrical engineering that students may be able to access the aviation industry as well. So aerospace engineering is great. Aeronautical engineering is great. But at most universities, it's a subset of mechanical engineering. So even mechanical engineering, mechatronics, robotics, those types of things may help them get into the aeronautical realm as well, OK? So I, I guess the thing I would say is make sure you're not limiting students to one path. There may be multiple options for them to access the career goal that they want down the road. Um, strong English skill, of course, organizational and logistical planning skill, an understanding of aerodynamics and flight principles. On my campus, the reason we titled this Look Up is because when students are walking, you may have heard me say this, Annie, when I'm visiting schools. When, when things are happening on my campus, Students are running between classes. What do you think happens when they hear a noise in the sky? Everything stops. And they're looking up to find out what type of an aircraft it is that's flying over. So when you have aeronautical in your university name, you get those types of kids. And I imagine a lot of the students you work with have thought about this from when they were this tall. And they are just thrilled to see an airplane. They go to the airport two hours early so they can sit at the windows and watch them come in and go out and trying to understand all the different aspects that go along with aviation. So um, find out if they're interested in flight and what aspects within, within uh, aviation they're interested in. If you have a student that wants to be a pilot, math again is important, not at the calculus level necessarily, um, but they will need probably pre-calculus as a preparatory math. For the IB, so that even math at the standard level? Standard level math at my institution is great, yeah. It's chemistry. They didn't necessarily get the previous slide that said that. I mentioned chemistry. For, for the units, mainly they're aiming for math and physics. Uh, Primarily, oh, okay. chemistry is, for engineering, is typically a requirement. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and that has to do with ABET accreditation of engineering programs at universities. There's an accrediting body, um, the association, the accrediting board for engineering and technology, which accredits engineering programs in the United States. And what I would say about that is 
that's an assurance of quality in an engineering program for you. If a university has an ABET, A-B-E-T accreditation for their engineering programs, you can be assured that that program is a high quality program. And if a student starts at an ABET accredited school and decides to transfer to another ABET accredited school, it makes that transfer much easier. Many graduate schools will not accept a student who doesn't come from an ABET accredited institution. So that's something for you to look at when they're considering schools. Um, not necessarily ranking, ABET accreditation is critical, okay? Um, students interested in flight, I think math and physics are still important, but as you said, if it's an IB student, standard level will work. Um, strong English skill, flight in particular, they need to work on their English skill because English is the aviation of, or is the language of aviation and they must be able to be understood and heard. And we give all of our flight students an assessment at the very beginning of their time to determine if they can continue in our flight program. And we have to give an evaluation on whether or not they can respond and answer questions that they would be hearing in the headset while they're flying. Um, so that's critical. Basic understandings of meteorology and weather, and they have to follow procedures. You must be able to follow procedures and be detail-oriented down to checklists and making sure everything comes through. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and that it can be learned, you know, it, it can be learned. And the way that flight programs are set up, especially if they're designed to develop commercial pilots, you have to do this. You have a checklist that you follow. If you miss one of those steps, you fail that flight. And then your parents are paying a lot of money to repeat those flights. So it can be learned. That's, that's definitely a learned skill. But if you have students that are already very detail-oriented, that's important. Um, if they're interested in business, again, math. But now we're talking about more business applications of math. Statistical analysis, um, the ability to look at uh, past history and, and predict future performance, those types of things. Um, English, be able to analyze and propose ideas. Writing is going to be critical for a business student. Uh, writing in English. Critical thinking skills, assessment, understanding of financial accounting systems, really important. And we have, at, at my school, uh, a College of Security and Intelligence as one of the divisions of my university. And so for these students, if they're interested in this, in helping to promote safety and security in the aviation industry or in aeronautics, they should be able to analyze situations, write reports, write critical analysis of intelligence gathering. Um, math will be important, but not at the level of an engineer or technical major. Um, politics, economics, world affairs, and how all of those link together to impact this industry is really, really important. So a very worldly type student may be interested in the security and intelligence track within aeronautics. Um, Actually, what, what we offer is a degree program in global security and intelligence studies. And that would be, <clears throat> that could look at uh, terrorism reduction and prevention. Uh, it could as well be uh, disaster response or private security, corporate security. Depending on what the needs are in each country, there may be, every, every country handles it differently. If they're federal employees that manage security in the aviation sector, or if they're private companies, it could be that as well. Um, we also offer, there are programs in safety science, which would be accident investigation, or could include accident investigation, and accident prevention. So you may have students, and I've had students from India who've actually studied in our Master of Science in Safety Science program and have become safety managers for airports or for airlines or for other industries. Industrial hygiene is a major topic now in making sure that you have safe environments for workers. 
uh, in your, at home. So that's another area. And psychology, human factors. Usually what happens in an aircraft incident or accident is uh, an error. There's been some sort of human error. And that could be due to fatigue. It could be due to, uh, you know, lack of understanding direction. There's many different factors that could, but most incidents happen as a result of human error. So we study the psychology of those types of things as well. Yes, yes. At, at least at my university, we have a degree program in industrial psychology and safety. Right, and that promotes, there is a section in that which is aviation safety. It could include accident investigation, but it also has a broader impact of managing the safety environment for an airline or for an airport and making sure that procedures are in place so that things are done in a safe and, a, and um, safe manner. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the, the ones that we specifically offer, and, and I, I don't want to just promote my institution, but I do want to promote my institution. Um, aviation Business Administration will focus on airline, airport management, as well as the management of industries that support the aviation sector. So um, it, it's, it's broad enough that we've had students graduate from that program and go to work for companies like Nike and Reebok, but they also go to work as airport managers and they manage the facilities. I had a student, he did his degree in uh, mechanical engineering actually, but he took a job with Lufthansa and he was managing all of the catering that Lufthansa had at Los Angeles International Airport. So we do have those types of programs and if students are interested in this field, Aviation Business Administration would be one that I would highly recommend, even though a mechanical engineer apparently can do it as well, <laughs> so, okay. So plans of study at a university level. We'll take a look real briefly. Yes, yeah, um, so we're gonna go a little in depth about each of our programs we kind of just mentioned. I'm actually gonna focus on the aerospace engineering factor. So aerospace engineering is at Iowa State University and engineering is located at many universities across the United States. But this is taking a look at a large US public institution. Um, within our degree program, you will see within their first year, they're starting right away in the aerospace engineering program. What is really nice about our program though, you can come in as undecided engineering. The first year, everyone is required to take the same courses as an engineer. It gives them one year to explore. With the engineering 101 orientation. It's going to focus on aerospace engineering, but they're also going to have be required to take an engineering orientation class that does touch upon all 12 of our subjects. And as we're going into the curriculum, for example, in the second year, you can see we're going to go up to calculus three. In aerospace engineering, calculus is key. It is very, and then also in our aerospace engineering program, you're going to touch on electrical, electrical engineering, materials engineering. So there's many different factors that go into aerospace. There's also going to be a research project that is going to be involved in their internship in their third year. And 83% of our students do do some sort of internship in our um, engineering program. And then also that option to always go study abroad and maybe do it in a different pro location. That can be offered at any one of our universities. But as you can see, these classes are difficult. A lot of the time, you, ha you have to have a total of 129 credit hours in order to graduate from this program. In from most engineering programs, it's the same at my institution. As I said, ABET accreditation requires these types of things. Yes, yeah, so. exactly. And also with this four-year program, you are also going to have to have those general core classes too. You're going to have to learn about world affairs. You're going to have to take those English composition classes. There's a lot that goes into this engineering program. And most of the time, our students do not graduate in a four-year time. They sometimes take four and a half years 
to graduate with a degree in engineering because of how many math classes and engineering classes they have to take in order to meet our ABED accreditation. So. Mm -hmm. They can at Embry-Riddle, yes. And, and they can at our school. The thing is, though, in HL level math, it is not physics-based math. They still have to take physics-based math. They might be able to get Calc 1 out of the way, but you're still going to have to do Calculus 2, and we also have a physics-based math class. Yeah, but definitely I think the IB higher levels, again, if they're an engineering student, HL physics is a, is a, a second HL I would recommend for them as well. Um, I, I do want to say too that aerospace engineering, this is one aspect, but the engineering programs across the board are going to have these requirements in them. Calculus throughout any engineering program, they're going to have to take those calculus courses. As far as prerequisites to be admitted, you know, we're going to give you the typical U.S. response. We, we look at the whole student, maybe not so much at Iowa State where it's a larger institution. At my institution, you might see a student that comes in a little bit lower. You might think, well, they're an average student in my school. Let, let us make that determination because there may be things within their transcript that shows maybe they didn't do well in your English course, or maybe they didn't do well in your literature course, but boy, did they really nail it in math and science. And I want that student. And they might write an essay that says, from the day I went to the airport when I was two years old, I've been just enthralled with airplanes, and I want to, to build airplanes. So those math skills and the, the passion that they have for it is going to have a bigger impact on admission at my institution than it would maybe at some other institutions. So as you compare, I think you want to take that into, into account. And um, I, I, I don't want to say, you know, don't try to get to MIT, don't try to get to Stanford. Certainly, if students can qualify and be accepted at that, go for it. But you may have better luck looking at a school that will look more individually at your application. So at Iowa State University, we're very transparent. We look at your grades. If, you, if your school is currently in CBSE right now, we look at the science track. If you are in CBSE and a commerce, we have to have mathematics. If you're in the humanities track, you don't qualify to come to Iowa State. That's just the bottom line of it. Um, and we do not look at essay. We don't look at a letter of recommendation. We're looking for a 60% or higher in the CBSE. Or for an IB student, we're looking at their HL and SL subjects. If they don't complete the diploma, that's okay. We're looking at four or hires. And for transfer credit, we're looking for six or higher. Yeah. Right. Sure. So the, the question is, as uh, school counselors, we need to have this kind of information with respect to everything we do right. to guide the students to don't just say, do you stand a chance to get into Iowa State, or do you even get a chance to get into such a university? Right. So uh, this information, which is, which is definitely not going to be the same. So. Uh, I have a task of giving this bandwidth to the counselor. Yeah. So how, how do I get to understand? That? Well, I think I think the main thing to understand is that every university in the United States will have a different set of requirements for admission, and the key thing would be that's why when I when I give a presentation, and and we'll hit this a little later on, but. There's five things that I tell students they need to think about. Number one, they need to think, does this institution have the degree program that you want them to have? So above all else, look at the degree program. Number two is, where is it located? What's it, what's it going to be like? You know, if you don't want to be in a cold place, you might not want to go to a state in the United States where it's cold all the time. If you don't want to be in a hot place, you know, there's, 
so the, the, the physical or the, the attributes of the school. Three, I think they need to look at student life. What's the student life like on that campus? How are they going to be supported? Fourth, um, cost. Talk to your parents about cost. What are the scholarship opportunities that are available? Because every school will have different, again. And fifth is just how does it make them feel? When they're researching it, when they're talking to you, is this the passion that they have? So I, I, I wish I could say there was one way to, to answer this question. But unfortunately, in the United States, there's not. And that's the flexibility of the US system that allows for innovation and, and um, people to really develop into the professional that they want to become. Um, but it isn't a standard answer. And basically, students will have to do the work that they, that they research. And you can help them to know how to research schools, speak to people like Kelsey and I, don't rely only on what's on the internet. Usually our offices will have someone that you can email directly and, and talk to them about the programs and services. Um, and I know that rankings are important in the eyes of parents and, and the students. But again, I'll say you can't compare schools like Iowa State and Embry-Riddle to each other. I have 2,400 students on my campus. We are focused on aviation and aerospace. Iowa State is a large public institution in the heartland of the United States. Different philosophies, different missions, a different place, and students will choose the one that suits their needs better. Um, I would much rather have a student that says, maybe I didn't do so, because I can make that decision. A student that might not have done as well in their literature and humanities courses, but really nails the math and physics side of it. And I can read that application, see that, because it's a human-to-human -human process. If, if larger schools that have much larger applicant pools may not be looking at that aspect of it. They want those minimum scores. So comparing schools in rankings or whatever in the United States is really not a valid thing to do. You're comparing apples and oranges. and. I would never say that MIT or Stanford are not great schools, but they're not Embry-Riddle. And they don't have the personal attention for the student that we do. So I, it's a long answer to <laughs> a very specific question, but I wish I could answer it better for you. I, I, I just can't. I don't know. Do you think of anything else? In the United States, we are the land of individualism. And that's what comes into higher education, too. We are, every university's different. Something's different to offer. And again, that individualism is very part of our culture. So this is why higher education is going to be an individual feat for each school. So it's just reaching out to us, reaching out to the counselors at the end of the day, and letting us know if you're not finding something specific on the internet. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we're always trying to update to make sure that information is very clear. So if you can't find it, you need to let us know too. Because yeah. that, this is not a one-way street. This is a communication, and that's why we're here today, is to learn about education and a part of different countries. Right. And I wish I could come more often and meet with students more regularly, but you know, we have to report to the budget office too. And we just can't do that very much. So, but email is easy. Yeah. And you know, at the ground level, when we are, uh, when we have to come up with lists for colleges based on the selectivity, uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, uh, you use lists that start off in broad strokes with the list available with uh, resources like Rugs recommendations yeah. is a good tool. Uh, do you guys feel the reports, though we use it uh, with a lot of And I'd say to talk about U.S. News and World Report, um, if you look at undergraduate aerospace yeah. engineering programs, Embry-Riddle is right there. You look at Forbes, and you may not see Embry-Riddle ever mentioned in there. So every ranking has a different methodology, and they may not even know. Some of these rankings that are worldwide, schools actually pay to be listed in their ranking. And, you know, I would, I would put those out there and say, 
Don't pay attention to the top 100 universities in the, in the world. Somebody's paying to be on that list. And that's, it's really not a valid comparison. So my institution is uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And we are located, I am from the Prescott, Arizona campus, which was where the star is. Uh, we're located close to the Grand Canyon National Parks in a beautiful mountain setting. If you think of Arizona, you probably think saguaro cactus, rattlesnakes, sand, Gila monsters, right. We're in the northern part of the state. We have pine forest, grasslands, it's beautiful climate, probably the best climate in the world. We get all four seasons, great opportunities. We also have a campus in Daytona Beach, Florida. I'm gonna talk to you about curriculum for three different areas. One is aviation, becoming a pilot. So as you can see in here, we start them off with math in the first year. College math for aviation, college math for aviation two, physics. Uh, then they're taking flight, FA, private single flight is their private pilot rating. So throughout all four years, we can scroll through, um, they are gonna take FA and AS classes that in their second year, they're taking instrument rating. In their third year, they're going to be taking commercial engine rating. So by their third year, a student in our flight program will have their commercial pilot license in the United States if they progress normally through everything. Some don't, some do. It, it's a very, it's not a linear process. It's a, a skills base and a proficiency model. So they must be proficient in that area before we can move them on. Um, and then the fourth year, they're finishing up with their flight safety, airline law types of classes as well. Um, crew resource management. So in aviation, they're starting with the math and science, but they start flying within that first three weeks of their term there. And you can have a student that will have no background in flight. They could have no flight hours at all, and they could start and become a pilot at the end of their degree. Um, aviation business, again, math, but quantitative methods. So analysis, those types of things. Uh, business management, communications, University 101. Let's go to the second year. Um, Technical report writing, business intelligence. I, I did skip one, but you saw an intro to aviation business in the first year. It was a very specific course. But we do the financial accounting, marketing in the second year. The third year, um, we're going to be looking at managerial accounting, and then you start getting into your airline and airport operations, which is going to look at specifically airline or airport management, but also those tourism-focused fields or related industries. Um, and then in their fourth year, you're looking at law, strategic management and consulting. And students in this, by this time are actually working in a small business incubator at our university and helping local businesses develop and get their business out there on the street. So they're developing business plans and, and helping them create business. Global security and intelligence. Not as much math here. You know, you're going to take your basic quantitative methods course, but they're looking more, as you can see, world affairs, global security, cyber security, English composition. They're developing a different skill set in this type of a program. Second year, you're going to get into intelligence writing, statistics, um, investigative methodology. Global intelligence, again, in the third year, international relations. And then in the fourth year, you're going to have a capstone where they are developing a security plan for, it could be a corporate security, governmental security. They are doing simulations of, of uh, disaster response or terrorism response. So in global security and intelligence, you may have these types of aspects within your final year. Um, and I've gone through it really briefly. I mean, that's three programs and an engineering program. Everyone's going to be different. Again, the key is get in touch with us if you have questions, please. And we can direct you to if our place is the right place for your kid, your kid, your students, I'm sorry, 
we will help you with that. But I would also say that it's important, again, to look at those factors that really make that student feel good about the choice they're making. And is it the right place for them to be? Because they may be able to access the aeronautics industry through other degree programs at other institutions. And we'll tell you that. I don't want to have a student come to my school and have a bad experience. That doesn't help our institution. It doesn't help your student. And it creates bad feeling between the counselor and me. And so I don't want that to happen. So we want to make sure that this is the right place for them to be, not just the high, highest ranked place for them to be. So if they don't have the skills, um, consider options. Most universities, especially the large universities, are going to have preparatory courses that may build them up to those skills. Again, it's okay if they meet those standards for admission that are very individual, but maybe they don't quite have the math skills. They might be able to take those courses at the university. Community colleges could be a good option for students. Consider that, especially cost-wise. Um, and talk directly to admissions counselors. We're going to be your real source. Whoops. Um, as you can see, you can type in aerospace. We, we put in aeronautical engineering in the United States in Google. And this is what came up. You get a few ads for DeVry. You get Michigan engineering. Um, but you'll see the list down at the bottom, MIT, uh, what's the other? Georgia Tech, and Stanford. Keep in mind, those are based on US News and World Report, most likely. And they're looking at graduate level programs. That's how those rankings are based. Your students are coming for an undergraduate degree. And you might need to refine that to look at what's the best undergraduate experience as opposed to the graduate experience. So try to look past the rankings and try to help the students understand that the, the bachelor's degree is your first step. You need to do very solidly in that. If they have hopes to stay in the US and work, they're going to need a PhD, a, a master's or a PhD later on down the road. And we can help them get there. So to wrap up, aeronautics is a really broad term. Let's try to dig down into that and help the students determine exactly what it is they want to study within aeronautics. Refine their choices. Be more specific. Understand your students and help them select a program that's best suited best suited for their strengths. And that might take into account large public, small private, what's the best place for them to be? Um, what's the right fit? And we know you've heard that before. So any questions that we can try to wrap up here? What time are we getting to? Oh, we're two minutes over, so not too bad, considering we started a few minutes late. Yeah. So at my institution, um, we'll tell you first, I will tell you a total cost of attendance without flight training. Um, so I would say generally this last year was 47000 per year. Flight training will add significantly to that cost. Students need to plan, and it's hard to tell because everybody progresses differently. Remember, it's not a linear progression. It's a proficiency-based model. Um, Everybody goes at a different rate. So 15000 to 30000 per year, depending on how they progress through their ratings. And I saw that with the school credit course. So that's how clear it is. Uh, one class a week plus two classes. It doesn't come to one class a week of flight. So Actually, the way that it works, it's a three, it may be a three credit or a one credit course for the flight. They're actually blocked in their schedule to fly every day from, you know, maybe it's a four-hour block. We block them out 
Now that, that doesn't mean they're flying for four hours every day. It means that they have availability to fly. We try to get students up about three times per week. That could be in a simulator, it could be in an actual aircraft, uh, it just depends. They, they try to have, we call them activities, and that could be a, a flight simulator with an instructor or it could be in the airplane with an instructor. But three times a week is what we shoot for. If there's a need for them to move a little faster, they may get additional flights built into that block. Um, yeah, and flight training, the good thing about flight training is pay as you go. So you don't pay up front 15000 a year and then if you don't make it, you know, you, you're, you've got all this money that isn't utilized or you've gone over. You pay as you go with us, so every activity they pay for that activity after each flight. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There needs to be money set aside to cover those flight costs. Any other questions? So do we have any other further questions from the audience? Um, Andy and I are going to stick around afterwards, so if you have any follow-up questions afterwards. Um, I do know we have, we were supposed to take a couple minutes for this real quick. Ms.